Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Wow, there's a good group here. I was about to say, we're gonna have a conversation about this incredible book, but perhaps we're all here for some therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to a conversation about Rise, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now. And we've got a fantastic panel for you. It's all three of the talented and brilliant authors of this incredible book. Of course, Jeff Yang, uh, author, journalist, writer, and Hudson's dad. Hudson's dad. <laughs> <laughs> Probably get that a lot. Only get that these days, but you know, yeah. working on it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Phil Yu, who's all the creator, the mastermind behind Angry Asian Man, the blog, and Philip uh, Wang, I'm sorry, who is the founder and uh, uh, co-founder of Wong Food Productions. Welcome all, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, so where do we begin? I think we begin right where the, the book does. I know you've answered this question many times, which is, you know, how did this all begin? Where do you get the inspiration to do it? Uh, the incredible part is you have written this book and have gotten contributors within two years during a pandemic, a lockdown. Uh, so yeah, let's start there. How did it all begin? It, well, you know, uh, there's that whole uh, alleged anecdote that, you know, Shakespeare wrote King Lear during the plague years and uh, Are you comparing us to Shakespeare right now? <laughs> pause, pause, no, no, no. Sha I know. But the plague, yeah, yeah. Shakespeare not really <laughs> compete plague, with well, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but 500 pages is a lot of stuff to write and, and actually having uh, two years of lockdown, uh, in, not to say that there was a silver lining to a glo global pandemic uh, that took millions of lives, but there is a sense in which uh, the very fact that we were being faced with uh, the enclosure of quarantine, the, the sort of rising tide of what felt like a, a ceaseless uh, barrage of anti-Asian hostility and, and, and abuse and bigotry coming from the highest levels of government, these are all things which really helped coalesce for us the need for this book. And to be fair, we had been talking about it before everything went into deep freeze. We'd actually had a lot of conversations between and among us about the fact that this three decade period that we thought was so pivotal, uh, one in which we came of age and saw so much change in our community, was largely invisible. And I mean, actually, it, it's something which uh, Philip, in, in fact, in particular, uh, called out uh, to me, I think we we're on a bus ride. <laughs> yeah, I think like it was it was something that, you know, I've never thought about this, like all this content as a book. It was just stuff that we talked about. And we all we like I was I was lamenting to 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 Jeff how, you know, we love Crazy Rich Asians. We love what it did for for representation in Hollywood. And, and it definitely had a positive impact. But I couldn't help but notice during that time when it was coming out, like in 2018, that all these headlines were celebrating, oh my God, first movie of, with Asian people in 25 years, <laughs> so, or first movie since Joy Luck Club, um, you know, and, and it was as if there was nothing in between, but there was so much that happened in those 25 years that, that our community did, that, that we as individuals did, that our peers did, and we just thought, man, it's I, like, unless someone writes those articles, no one's ever going to know about um, about all those achievements that we know was there, that we lived through ourselves. So it was things that we just talked about, but it was Jeff that was, had the idea of, hey, why don't we turn this into a book? And I, and I, and I just thought, uh, sure, okay. I didn't, know, <laughs> I didn't know what that would entail, but yeah, I'm down to help out. I did not think it was gonna turn into this <laughs> 500 pages. If, um, if I recall correctly, the original like, proposal for the book was like somewhere around 300 pages, right? Yes. And now it's 500, so it, during the process, the, the stuff that we said, we have to include this, it, like, it ballooned bigger and bigger over, the, over time. Yeah. Jeff bamboozled us. <laughs> Frick doesn't write his book. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you, you bamboozled them because I, I want to <laughs> say, and I should have said this you know, before we began the program, but thank you so much for this gift and this love letter to our community. And this is exactly what would have helped me growing up as that 
awkward Asian queer person, you know, in the, uh, uh, the I guess, 90s in 2000s, right? It probably would have saved me a lot of money from therapy. And, and um, I want to say, you know, just leaving this on my coffee table and just seeing people who look like me and these amazing people who've contributed so much, that helped. And then it also helped whoever came over, just kept touching it and picking it up and and it opened up so many conversations. So tell us, you know, how you got so many people to contribute in the amount of time that you did. And then what was the strategy behind choosing you know, who you were going to include or how you were going to go about asking them you know, what to say, what to write? I think that uh, a lot of the early part of this book was just the three of us sitting in front of uh, open windows, you know, in Google Docs, <laughs> just harvesting our brains and, and thinking of everything and everybody who was meaningful to us and who we either wanted to speak to, speak about, or bring into the book as contributors. And I mean, it was just hours at a time. We just sit there on, on Zoom or on conference calls saying, you remember that? Oh yeah, what about that and that and that and that? Thus, 500 pages, but... <laughs> I, yeah, mean, it was I mean, it was definitely a, a case where we were like, if, if, if we, we had this book growing up, what would we want to see in this? Like, what was important to us, you know? Because the thing about history is that when you're living it, you don't really know that it's history. It's just like the stuff you experienced and the things that were important to you. And we thought, like, if we were trying to, in some way, canonize all that, st all, that all, those, all those people and ideas and, and happenings, what would we want in the, what would we want in this book you know what would we want to have in our fingertips as we as we flip the pages you know so it was as simple as that uh, uh, go ahead sorry and i think the the other part of it of of um assembling the team if you were like of our contributors and the people we wanted to involve um a lot of it was like we could get them like should we like you know like it, I would. I want to talk to this person. Like, do you think we could get that? I bet we could. I bet they would want. You know, like, and I bet they want to tell their story. I bet no one's asked them about their story. Like, let's get them. You know. And so it was. It was a lot. It was. There was a lot of dreaming involved in the beginning. Yeah, it was definitely not very scientific. I think a lot of people think like, wow, this is it's so comprehensive. It's all so up. Like, you know, you guys covered so many things, and it really was just us, just imagining and thinking, oh yeah, remember that? Remember that? It helped that we had someone that literally kept a blog of just all the happenings <laughs> of everything. And, and Jeff, you know, with his magazine as well. To your point about not realizing that you're living history until like, you know, you, you, you're past it. As the, as the one that was supposed to come in as the 2010s, you know, um, uh, I guess, correspondent, it was also weird for me to think like, oh, what I've, what I just did, what I just did like five years ago is now history, oh my God. Um, but that was essentially what, what, was, what we had to do is kind of try to have this vision of, okay, in 10 years, in 15 years, what should we hope um, is preserved and what do we feel like could be forgotten if we, don't, if we don't mention it? And just to your point too about like all the different contributors, you know, we were very, very aware from the get-go that we are three cis, Asian, East Asian men that were, you know, in charge of this book. And we wanted to be very, very conscious right from the get go of, okay, we need to bring in other perspectives. We need to tell or look into topics that weren't necessarily our personal experience, but we know was a thing in maybe other sub communities or, or um, you know, groups within our monolithic Asian American banner, right? So that was something that was very important to us. And even as we were going through that Google Doc of just throwing things around, we, we started making note of, oh, this is starting to look too much like representation here. Let's try to balance it out with making sure that this piece gets in there. So that's where it kind of became a little bit more scientific. Yeah. And that's why it's 500 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and many more versions to come, I'm sure. <laughs> mm. Well, um, you do split the book up in its structure in a way where you go through the decades, the 90s, and then 2000s, and 2010. So why don't we do that? We'll start with 1990, <laughs> and I'll read just a little bit from uh, Jeff, this is from you, that you, you, you start off with, I was born in 1968. I'm starting with that because since I first became aware of it, I've always been a little bit haunted by the fact that I was born in the same year as Asian America itself. And when I read that, I got the chills. Let's talk about that. What did you mean by that? So Asians have been in America since before there was an America. Right. 
there were Filipinos who jumped off of galleon ships uh, and swam across to the mainland of what would become America. There were Vietnamese uh, who came early. There were people who were sojourners and even early settlers, right? Long before there was even the idea that America would become a place where many people would be welcomed from many different nations of many different colors and backgrounds and races and nationalities. And yet, being Asian in America does not make you Asian American, right? This is something which we you know, contend with across our communities and even across generations. My parents don't really think of themselves as Asian American. They are Taiwanese, you know, Taiwanese American, uh, sometimes just American when they are asserting that they're Americans. <laughs> but Asian American is a bit of a bridge too far for them. And the idea, the, 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 the language around Asian America is kind of a relatively recent vintage. Uh, 1968 actually was the year in which the term Asian American was created very close to here. Uh, Berkeley, California, and also at SFSU, there were uh, third world liberation strikes and protests, and, and a group of Asian Americans, uh, before they were Asian American, a group of Asian students who were protesting uh, on behalf, actually, of uh, Huey Newton, the jailed Black Panther, wanted to march alongside the Afro-American students who were creating the rally for his freedom. And they didn't have a literal banner to march under. So they created a banner. They, they, they painted a banner. And on that banner, it said, the Asian American Political Alliance. And we never think about simple acts like creating a banner, uh, like uh, you know, making signs, you know, creating symbols as having ripple effects that can change entire communities. But that did, because shortly after the first use of that term, the term became readily used across academia, across government, across policy. By 1972, there were bills being passed, or not passed as the case may be, in Congress using the term Asian American. You know, there was a, specifically a, a bill uh, designed to try to create a sort of Asian American Bureau <laughs> that would uh, address the growing uh, issues surrounding the Asian demographic in America. And what that meant was, uh, for all intents and purposes, this term, which was created as kind of a term of art or convenience, was going to have some kind of meaning for us. It was a box we'd have to check at some point for the rest of our lives. I do um, I want to add to that also, you know, my parents didn't really think of themselves as Americans. They always thought of themselves as refugees, as they are. They're refugees from Laos, but they didn't see that until they had to check a box that said Asian American. Phil, thoughts on the, the 90s? Um, it's interesting. You know, I always say, one thing I, so one thing about what Jeff just said, I read an interesting quote from someone who attended the meeting where they came up with that name, Asian American Pacific uh, Political Alliance. They, somebody said, I went into that meeting, it was like some apartment in Berkeley. I went into that meeting and I was Oriental. When I came out, I was Asian American. And I always thought that was such an interesting, like, it, you know, it's almost a religious moment, right? But, but the way I always see it also is that the term Asian American, the identity Asian American is, uh, it's an opt-in identity. It's a voluntary identity, right? Like, like Jeff said, his parents don't consider them, themselves Asian American. Um, you know, and for, for, I think for a long time myself, I didn't consider my, I didn't know what Asian American really meant. You know, it's, it was just the box you checked off on, on, on applications and things like that. I think at some point in my life, I opted into the idea that you are Asian American. And what that means is you've, you, you're joining in with this, whatever that means and whatever the, the burdens and the, and the responsibilities that come with it. Um, and so it is something that you, you have to choose to be Asian American, you know? I, I, I don't think when I was, so in the 90s, I was in elementary school, into, <laughs> into high school. Uh, why are the girls, guys? <laughs> Come on. Uh, um, but I, what, what, I, what I, just to your point about you have to opt in, I, I felt like actually in the 90s, and thankfully growing up in the East Bay, in the Bay Area here, um, I felt, I was, I, I opted in into AZN before Asian American. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I didn't even think about my Asian American likeness because I was thankfully around. Um, even though I, I grew up in a predominantly white suburb, Walnut Creek, shout out to 925, um, <laughs> which I still have the area code on my phone. Um, but yeah, like I was very lucky that my parents put me around other Asian families, and I had Asian friends, and um, I I n never felt the, the feeling that I was lesser because of my Asianness. And so when there was, if, you, if anyone remembers, like there was this late 90s, early 2000s period where like there was this Asian pride era. Um, it was a whole look. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, just, I, I felt a lot of pride being Asian. And I actually feel like that me not having that chip on my shoulder allowed me to create unapologetically, allowed me to be myself um, in, in spaces and not worry how other people were looking at me. And I think it's why the content and from Wong Fu and, for, and, and that I was able to pull from for this book was able to exist because, um, yeah, the, the lens I had was, was, was coming from a place where uh, I, never, I never felt other, specifically for my race, it was maybe just for me being weird or something. <laughs> Which I don't know if that's better or worse, but yeah, anyways. Can I add about the, about the Asian thing? <laughs> I, uh, we have, this book comes in an audiobook form, and our narrators do a fantastic job where there's like three or four, and, and we read our, our own essays, but the AZN section, <laughs> it's really hard to hear, uh, to listen to if you don't see the actual yeah. words oh, and the man. way the typography works with oh, AZN no. stuff, right? Yeah. And, and then he, he d and the, the narrator, he doesn't say a AZN, he says Asian, like, oh. and I'm like, oh, you're not getting it quite right, man. Like, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I, I don't know if, if, for those of you who, like myself, did not grow up really through that era, there was an era defined by uh, AOL Instant Messenger and handles of things like, you know, Lil Asian Foxy Gal <laughs> with capital A's and threes instead of E's and stuff like that. And I mean, I'm not mocking your culture. You're trying but, to... but. <laughs> I'm so offended right now. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell the the audio the audio book of this is all of a sudden a little bit filtered through the uh, the, the challenges of turning what is essentially a graphic medium into mm -hmm. something that is uh, that is audible. <laughs> but I, but I think I think the fact that we have this span of three decades is what makes this book really so wonderful. Is that I got to learn a lot like from from Jeff like that even that whole history lesson of, of 1968. I didn't know about that you know. And so, and I get to teach him about the Asian culture. I think. <laughs> but, but, but I think that that actually shows, like, th that's why the book is so great in showing just how much progress we actually have made. That I, I definitely acknowledge and recognize that, you know, my generation and even your generation sits on the progress of previous people's work and previous communities and previous uh, movements. And um, honestly, like, it's it's what I, I I hope you know, just people can can feel that progress when they read through it in order, um, yeah. I'm just gonna say that my younger son, who's 14, was like, Dad, what's an import tuner model? And I was oh, like, God. you have to ask Uncle Phil. No. <laughs> <laughs> I totally thought that part of me, that, um, that secret historical data of uh, the screen name, Asian, sweet as Asian girl, <laughs> 17. I we were no, talking about that at in the, the time. Commonwealth I, th right now. I thought that that was going to be a secret. I never was going to divulge. Thanks, guys, for this <laughs> book. Um, anyway, let's, talk, let's talk about 90s you know, pop culture. Uh, I'm really glad that you included Margaret Cho mm -hmm. in this book. Yay, Margaret, yeah. And I, I really do feel like we should stop and just talk about that because Margaret Cho did you know, changed TV in a lot of ways. Uh, she did. Uh, and and in, in some ways, <laughs> I changed Margaret Cho. <laughs> and I talk about it in, in, uh, in the introduction. Um, it's, it's something which, even to this day, kind of haunts me. But at the time when Margaret's show was being crafted, right, uh, All American Girl, it was going to be the first network primetime sitcom featuring an all Asian cast. Uh, it was going to be focused on, on Margaret Cho, this incredible, uh, just rising star in the stand-up comedy world, brash, bold, you know, queer, body, all, all in in all places. And it was just so exciting to me. Uh, I mean, I knew her from the community. I I'd actually, I was friends with her. I, uh, she announced that the show was being picked up from pilot at a stand-up comedy event that I'd helped produce in New York City. 
And so I had this investment in it, as I think many of us did. Uh, so many Asian Americans who were planning, you know, watch parties for when All American Girl finally would hit the screen. Uh, and then the reality hit that uh, at the time I was TV critic for The Village Voice. And uh, even though I was a junior critic, uh, the only non-white, in fact, the only non-white, non, you know, non-white male critic, there were no female critics, it was white male critics and then there was me. Uh, I got the opportunity uh, or, or the assignment to write my first featured review and it was of All American Girl. And I, I looked at the videotape, this VHS tape, for those of you guys who do not know what a VHS tape is. Dude, I know what a VHS tape is. <laughs> <laughs> my, parents, my parents owned a video store, my friend. My parents are sitting right there. They're, they owned a video store. Hi, parents. Yeah. <laughs> well, videotapes uh, back in the day uh, contained, you know, maybe a, a couple of hours of the content. And in this case, it had uh, a, the first three episodes of All American Girl. And I was handed it and told my, my editor said, OK, this is your big chance. You can do this cover review on All American Girl. It looks like it's going to be important. Uh, and I said, yeah, I know it's important, but I feel a little bit compromised. Like I have a con conflict of interest, not just because I know Margaret, but because I want this show to succeed. And if it's not good, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And my editor, also a white man, said, you have to actually make a decision. Is your job more important than being friends with celebrities, right? Do you actually feel like you can, you can professionally uh, address this, or do I have to assign this to somebody who probably will have a take that is, is even more distanced and even more kind of problematic on some level? And so with that kind of galvanizing me, I took it home, I watched those first three episodes, and they weren't, they weren't good, or more importantly, they weren't Margaret, right? Uh, what I thought was going to be on screen, I don't know what I thought it was going to be, because it was going to be at 8.30 after Home Improvement on ABC. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, Tim the Tool Guy and then Margaret Cho. I mean, obviously, there was going to be some sort of coming together in the middle. Uh, but I wrote my review, and my review was, was harsh. And it was, I, I think I actually compared um, the show to, like, a proof of life video, uh, you know, with, with Margaret as sort of, like, hostage within this format that did not reflect her or her comedy. And... The next day, she, she literally, uh, she called me up and said, I heard the reviews out, can you fax it to me? I'm like, oh my god. And, uh, and I did. And she called me up almost immediately afterward and said, I was afraid that it was going to be a negative review. I didn't know how, how negative it was going to be. I'm telling you right now, when they cancel this show, they're going to throw this on the table and say, this is the only guy, the only Asian American TV critic in America. Even your community doesn't support this. Why should we? And she wasn't entirely wrong. That's kind of what happened. So, you know, this whole fallow period for Asian American primetime television, you know, that happened after that cancellation, it, it, it was a lot. It was a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you even say on here that the you know, end of the era, and then we kind of go into, I guess, a really long time until... Primetime will even consider it and take up another show that's focused on an Asian American family, and we'll talk about that a little later. <laughs> um, yes. But yeah, Phil, uh, you know your your thoughts on '90s Asian American TV? Um, I, I look at so '90s is when I came. I was in high school in the '90s, um, and uh, I look at that moment in time where like it was like All American Girl and the Joy Luck Club, Dragon the Bruce Lee story, very important movie to me. Um, Move on. Mulan, Vanishing Sun. These are, but these are all like little moments where it's just like you just like. I grew up watching television, just looking anywhere, please anywhere for like an Asian face, like you know, and you would just note that there's it's it's, it's marked by such scarcity that like I'll just take anything I can get, you know, um, and I think that is what really kind of defines that era. And so we we actually focus a lot about um, a lot of a lot of pop culture moments in the '90s. Because, um, like, that's all we had, and so the, like these were these little moments were lifted up as like as our like our icons and our heroes. We had all, extend discussion on whether or not 
uh, Dante Bosco as Rufio in Hook was like an important <laughs> character. And it's like, it was me and Philip like trying to convince <laughs> Jeff like, no, that is a big, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things throughout the book where it was like the two, two of us in combination telling the third person, no, no, this is a big deal. We need to put it in the book. <laughs> Did anyone listen to Bizarre Love Triangle? Come on. <laughs> okay, I'm just making sure. I'm just making sure. I think Todd is here. Right? <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Todd Inouye, folks, he actually wrote that piece about uh, the critical importance of uh, essentially mostly British synthesizer-driven uh, <laughs> pop music to a certain generation, a certain cohort of Asian Americans back in the 1990s. And Which I had to be put on. Like I, <laughs> like I, I had to be educated. Now you on. know. Now I know. Now you know. Now I know. <laughs> take a break from my questions and we have a couple questions from our audience thank you uh how can art help create allyship among communities of color I, you know I'll, I'll field that first because i think that one of the things that art does um when it's done right is it challenges us to be more human it, it takes us out of those those boxes that we have had to check off all our lives and forces us to empathize with other stories and with other narratives and with other positions. And I think one of the things that, even as a, as a, a critic uh, all these years, has become more and more apparent to me is that the ability to, to simply just sit in a seat and look at somebody else's story and project yourself into it humanizes them in a way that almost nothing else does. I mean, I don't know if you guys are on Twitter, <laughs> God forbid, <laughs> but there's a lot of conversation on Twitter, uh, especially right now, because there's this movie Turning Red out there, incredibly Asian Canadian movie about this, you know, about uh, girls and puberty and, you know, uh, the changes that occur to one's mindset and one's body. And this white critic wrote extensively about how exhausting it was to simply watch this thing that he felt he was not reflected in. And the very first thing, <laughs> the very first thing that every Asian American, every person of color, uh, most women, <laughs> you know, across the internet was like, we are exhausted every day, <laughs> you know? That's all we see is, is, is pictures of you. And if this one thing that we have, you are exhausted by, what does that mean for the rest of us, right? So. I do think that when we engage properly, when we engage with pop culture on that empathic level, it changes everything about us. Uh, just to add to that too, I think um, just art and media too, it, it exp it's, an, it's a way to expose people to communities and, and people and stories that you normally wouldn't have in your, in your daily life that are not in your immediate circles and maybe um, just not available to you. So I think like a lot of times people, um, for them to see some of these stories are our faces or, or or someone from a different community it has to be in fiction first even though it's even though it's someone else's reality in at least in your world i have to consume it as a fictional piece or maybe a documentary or something like that but basically come into my world or something or or come, come like get come into my 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 scope so i can understand so that when i when i actually do venture out there and search for you know allyship or or experienced uh, intersections then it's, it, it becomes like less foreign to us, to us, to us, I guess. So I think like a lot of times, even for me personally, um, that's what I enjoy looking out for stories and, and, and content that is not necessarily from within my own, I guess, sphere. I think one of the central questions of this book and also our own respective works over the years has been who gets to tell our stories? You know, who gets to have agency and ownership over these, about how our stories are told and who gets to tell them and you know what stories are told and and i mean when it comes to asians in america like for too often and for too long like it was just other people on the outside looking in like making up stories honestly in a lot of ways and so um a lot of this is trying to reclaim that and a lot of that was like saying like we want to tell the story ourselves and um and what is the story you know and so the book is a, an attempt an attempt at that i think the best clapback on that turning red tweet was, was, was like the people saying, I'm so glad you could relate to a talking rat and fish <laughs> more than a, more than a girl, girl in Canada, Asian girl in Canada. <laughs> there were a couple things about the book that I had thoughts validated how it felt for a really long time. Um, one of the things that came up for me was just how many people that 
we didn't even consider Asian American or Asian at all. And that, you know, in my, and then it, I would be like, oh, I had no idea Naomi Campbell, you know, is Asian. And I think that goes back to like just being erased sometimes, right? In uh, pop culture and the media. And then a couple other things that uh, also came up for me was the history that it wasn't just like we were saying, we're identifying people who are Asian, we're claiming them, but that we have real true history in this country, like for example, even in music and the cross-cultural solidarity work that we've been doing for so long in music. So when people talk about like Asians in hip hop, for example, but glazing over the true history of our allyship in other communities, that's what I love about what the book does. It gives us a visual and uh, about that and we can see it. Want to go into the 2000s? <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just uh, yeah. shout out one person? Because when you mentioned music, I will say that one of our favorite things in the book, in addition to that bizarre love triangle piece, uh, <laughs> was this running feature uh, by, by Richie Menchavez, Richie Tractivist. Tractivist, you out of there somewhere? Yeah, back there. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's the Asian American playlist. And what it does is it takes us one space where I think Asian Americans generally do not know that we are reflected, that we're a part of. And it, it pulls it out and makes it something you can actually literally li put headphones on and listen to. I mean, literally. He actually made Spotify playlists for all these. But he identified all these, these um, musicians and the works they did going all the way back into the early history of popular music itself, where we are, in fact, present. Uh, and it just was kind of life changing for me yeah. to know that that could be in my head. Yeah, you know? it's such a it's it's such a well done. He, Richie, you, you understood the assignment. That's what <laughs> that's what I can say. Like he, when we said like we want playlists of of you know Asian American musicians, like and a lot of things that people might not know. I think it'll be surprised. And I mean, he surprised all of us, honestly. Yeah, great feature. Two thousands. Okay. Two thousands. All right. <laughs> um. I'm gonna choose this paragraph right here. Angry Asian man is a blog, and I've been at it since before I knew we were calling them blogs. When I do tell people about it, I explain that it's the longest running, most widely read independent blog devoted to Asian American news, culture, and commentary. I have no idea if this claim is actually true, but... <laughs> <laughs> Journalism. <laughs> But no one has called me on it yet, so it seems like a safe enough assertion. As for how long I've been doing it, I keep thinking I've done the math wrong, but I've been running Angry Asian Man for over 20 years, which means I've basically uh, been known as a Angry Asian Man for longer than I've lived in any one place, longer than I've attended any school, longer than I've held any job. I'm a professional angry Asian man. <laughs> Your response. Okay. <laughs> so um, coming back here to San Francisco actually is 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 quite wonderful uh, for this occasion. I started Angry Asian Man. I, I grew up in the Bay Area and started Angry Asian Man while I was here after college, uh, back home in Sunnyvale. Um, uh, but also during that time, this is an era where I was working for the center, for what was, what is now known as the Center for Asian American Media. Uh, back then it was called NATA, uh, which runs, what was then called the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival, now known as CAMFest. Very, a lot of my formative years were spent there. A lot of stuff we write about the, in the book. Um, I, uh, the, my love for all of that, for that scene was inspired by my time here. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me about ang why did you start Angry Asian Man? Like, what what made you so angry? Um, and it was not, it was it was not any one incident that made me angry. And and to be honest, I'm not a particularly angry person, um, <laughs> uh, at least not emotionally. So, but I I I, I think I just wanted to. Put, here's the thing: people ask why did you start it? I didn't know I was starting something when I was doing it. Right? You just kind of start doing something, and you like it, and you love it. Um, and people respond to it, and then, and 20 years later, I'm writing a book. You know, like that's what happens. But I think what really, what Angry Asian Man did, and and writing the blog really did, was give me a voice, and it, it made me realize that I had a voice, um, a voice that I felt like 
I've been asking, I, I've been waiting for permission to use like my whole life basically. And then some point you, you're in the middle of writing this blog and you realize like, I, I don't need permission at all. I'm doing it right now. And it's, and it's, it's working, you know? Um, and so I think the response to Angry Asian Man over the years has been so interesting to see because a lot of Asian Americans also feel this way. Like I, I've been waiting for permission to feel like this. I've been waiting for permission to say these things. Thank you for articulating the things that I've been on my mind, but I just, I didn't have the language to do it. Or I just thought I was not allowed to say this as an Asian American. So it's very, it's, it's a weird feeling to be known for this thing and to be celebrated for this thing that just started like in my bedroom. And um, just because like, I'm, I just want a place to talk about my feelings, you know, like, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's weird, it's weird. I'm going to say something. I think for the 2000s, that's when a lot of us were starting to share from our bedrooms. <laughs> and whoever was going to read it, whoever was going to follow us, we were willing to put it out there. And so I think that it has a huge um, focus on the Internet and how it's shifted us as Asian Americans. So um, maybe, Philip, you could add a little bit to that. Yeah, I feel like um, the 2000s, just the reason, I think the reason why so many people started becoming not just willing, but it, it, the, the technology was finally available. And also culturally, we were shifting towards being open to um, letting go of a little bit of that privacy and, and, and utilizing these tools and the, te and the technology. And, um, and, and, I, and obviously Wong Fu ben, you know, was, w w came up around that time too, but I think um, it was always there. It just, it's just, we, we just were never given the ability to, um, you know, circumvent the red tape or, or, or overcome some of these gates that were um, built for decades prior. We finally had a, had, had a way to say, hey, I'm just gonna do it myself. Um, and whoever wants to follow, whoever agrees um, can, can join. And now it's, it's, it's stuff that's so, basic and normalized in, in our daily lives. Oh yeah, I'm gonna post a picture and I'm, oh, I'm gonna like someone's photo, yada, yada. I mean, there was a time I remember when, you know, when Facebook just came out and, you, and, and people didn't want people to see their photos. It was like scary. You remember like, oh my gosh, privacy is such a, such a big deal. And now, now people get upset if not enough people saw their photo. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like how much of like a shift we as a society have just kind of like normalized wanting to be heard. And, but I think for us as a marginal, for any marginalized communities, when you finally get that chance to um, have a platform, uh, and you don't even realize you're taking it. And then maybe, you know, as Asian people, we're, we, we do it more timidly because we're, we're afraid to say outright, hey, I'm gonna try this because we, we, haven't, we were never brought up to have that voice. So it's a little scary to say, I'm gonna do it. So we, we start off just in our bedrooms, just a thing on the side. And then little by little, it becomes, it becomes a 20 year old blog. I mean, the story of Asian America's emergence over these three decades is actually a story about technology on mm. some level, right? Uh, because I started out launching a magazine, a magazine that would not have been possible if it wasn't for desktop publishing and personal computers. You know, back when we had like Mac Pluses and <laughs> we're using, you know, PageMaker and so forth. Um, and then the blog revolution came along and then YouTube. And now we're in this world of social media and sharing and, and kind of constant engagement. But over that period of time, you also had this series of cohorts, uh, multiple generations of Asian Americans who came you know, into America as young kids or were born here, who were raised by loving immigrant parents uh, and high expectation immigrant parents, <laughs> who because of that were very educated in many cases, but also secretly had these passions, these desires to do something other than maybe what was directly expected. And uh, it's all those people who had to tap away in their bedrooms or had to do things under the covers or had to you know, find other outlets for expression that ended up very slowly over 30 years carving a little hole in the walls uh, that, that prevented us from accessing everybody else out there. And now in this world of sharing, the reason why Asian Americans punch above our weight in social media, the reason why we can send things trending, why we're seemingly everywhere across the digital space, is because all these people came of age and all their younger brothers and all their kids came of age. And this is our mainstream media. 
Yeah, I, I still remember the first time I interviewed Hudson um, when the sh when Fresh Out the Boat was about to start. They were doing a press tour, and we got invited to go interview the the stars, these kids, right? And and <laughs> Hudson, who's what, what, how old was he when he started? Like eight, nine, nine years old. Nine years yeah. old. He he was telling me. How many subscribers do you have? I want to be a YouTuber when I grow up. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you're on TV, bro. <laughs> I'm trying to get to you. And it's so true. Like this is this is a new age where the expectations of what mainstream is or what um, how to build an audience are, are is completely flipped. Um, obviously, like there's power is still in certain areas, and the and the money is definitely still still in certain areas. But in terms of uh, barriers to share and barriers to have a voice. Um, that that is completely eliminated now, for better and for worse. Um, so it's really it's really interesting to see how Asians have kind of utilized it for for you know themselves. Let me go back to audience questions because we've got a few, and I want to get to them before Lightning we round. end the program and end with uh, 2010. What is keeping Asians from being Americans? I mean. We are Americans, <laughs> at least those of us who are allowed to, right? I mean, there are still our walls around uh, citizenship in this country. There are still immigrant pushback against immigration. But I guess if the question is, why can't we just be Americans? I think that's a question which always comes loaded with all kinds of expectations for what American really means. If, if uh, the idea is that you come here as an immigrant or you're a child of immigrants and you have to somehow slip the traces of whatever cultural baggage, cultural foundation, cultural anchor you might have had, um, and then somehow just become as adjacent as possible to the largely white mainstream. Well, I mean, that's something that's primarily asked of certain kinds of people, people who come from places other than, say, Europe, right? Uh, because we have St. Patrick's Day, and we have all these celebrations of eth white ethnicity that are completely permitted. But when you're Asian, or when you're you know, Latinx, or when you're from some other space which is visibly different, I think there's always that slight tension of like, hey, can you just be a little bit more like over here, you know, and not so much over here? It kind of weirds us out a little bit that you wear that headgear, or you eat that food, or that's what in the 90s certainly we grew up with. I think the interesting thing, though, is by the time you get to the 2010s and my kids, the 2020s, et cetera, that is also flipped, right? The cultural expectation, that similarity and, uh, and uh, you know, acculturation and, and removing oneself from difference is what makes you American has gone the other way, where now people are like, you know, what makes it cool to be American is that we have so many options of what we can be. But I don't know. That's just what I think. I the question was, why? What, why what what's, is, what's keeping Asians from being American? I don't accept the premise of the question. I, I <laughs> like. I just. I'll say this, and I say this often. Like, if you go to Asia, nobody in Asia considers themselves Asian, yeah. right? Like, there is no category for that. Like, they all consider themselves a member of their own nation of origin, right? Like, or your culture. You're Korean. You're Japanese. You're Indian. And it's not to come here. We come to here. Right, where we're, this la overarching label is slapped on us, and so we gotta figure out what that means. Um, but I don't think anything. I don't think that that being Asian and then being American are exclusive to one another. Like there's, it's not as though there's some magical flip that happens, and then suddenly Asians are American. Um, and I think that, again, if we're trying to define what Asian American means or what Asian means, we also have to define what American means, right? And that. That is sort of the battle for the soul of that question of what is what is American. Um, that's we've been waging forever, you know, um, and before even Asians and Asians and Asian Americans entered that conversation and had a stake in that as well. Um, but yes, at I don't I, I yeah I have a problem with parsing out what that question even means. I, I think the the question is actually just how, what what's preventing us from being othered here in America. That's how maybe I was is perceived. And perceiving it, which I don't have an answer to that. I feel like it's a very geopolitical <laughs> answer that um, has a very long tail of, of 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 what needs to happen, or should it even have to happen for us to have to um, be more accepted in, in this country? And, and 
I don't know. I, 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 I personally don't ever want to not have Asian or Chinese or Taiwanese not associated with my identity here in America. So I'm not trying to say, hey, only look at me as American. I don't know. That's just me personally, because I'm never going to get away from this. So <laughs> we might as well talk about it. That's kind of how yeah. I see it. Yeah. Thank you for this Asian American almanac. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on our evolving AAPI identity? Uh, during this time of anti-Asian hate? Maybe also that question, I think the previous question can apply to this as well, because you know, during COVID, all of a sudden, we're, some of us are not Asian American, we're Asian from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, how can we collectively come together to not only stop attacks and finally not be afraid? Well, I mean, I think those are two separate beats, right? The first is about the evolution of what it means to be Asian American in this era. Uh, and the second is how do we defend ourselves literally from being pushed off subway platforms or beaten in the streets? And, uh, and yet they're related on some level. Uh, because one of the things I think that we frequently talk about is that this is not actually a new thing. You know, this whole thing where Asians are being blamed for uh, pandemics or economic duress or loss of jobs. This is something that's happened cyclically over generations and generations and generations. And the stories that are being told, the same ones that Phil mentioned, are being placed upon us, are the ones that keep on coming back. All the way back to like the 1800s, I mean, when Chinese first started coming here and turning San Francisco into what it was, there were already the archetypes, there were already the stereotypes. You know, there were Chinese people eating rats and dogs. There were Chinese people who were not clean and who were unassimilable. There were Asian, there were Chinese women who were seen as, you know, exotic, uh, you know, available uh, objects, essentially, right? And, and those stories were illuminated in editorial cartoons and then eventually translated into war propaganda. And then by the 60s and 70s, were turned into you know, anti-Japan, you know, anti-economic peril uh, type stories. And all that stuff worked its way into popular culture, right? All the things you saw in cartoons and comic books growing up, for those of us who saw the dark side of Looney Tunes, right? All that stuff is embedded in the cultural imagination of America. So, where are we as Asian Americans in this era? We're fighting back by writing back. We are telling stories in order to try as hard as we can to overwrite that collective unconscious that we still have to face every time we go out in the streets. And I think that the thing that's most amazing about this era is that we are finally doing so without subtitles, you know, without explaining ourselves defiantly, telling stories that are incredibly idiosyncratic and maybe exhausting if you don't actually sit into that that particular space. But that's the only way we can actually get people to sit down and look at us as we actually are. I, I feel like we definitely struggled with the current environment, even though it has been happening as th throughout history, as Jeff is you know, listing out, like it does feel different right now. It feels very, very scary. It feels very in, in our face. It's, um, and maybe that's because of social media and we are seeing it we're literally seeing, imagine seeing just every crime that, that, that's out there. You don't have to have like the local newspaper, you know, be delivered to you. You can just see it, right? And it just gets passed around, passed around. So it does feel very different. Obviously, writing a book that's so celebratory, at, at, literally at the same time that all these terrible tragedies are happening, something that I personally have really struggled with, um, even just promoting the book, right? Um, but then I think like, you know, just to what Jeff's saying is that you, if, if we don't push back not necessarily, like, not just physically and not just, you know, through our voices, but also just by trying to write our stories and try to control our own narrative and to try to um, stand up for ourselves um, in all these different um, layers, then, uh, then yeah, we're, we're going to be pushed, like, physically and, li you know, literally, right? So this, this is what content, this is what these um, movements are all about. And so when it, comes, wh when it comes to, like, oh, what can we do to protect ourselves, like, that's... That's an answer that I, I think we're all searching for, um, and there's not one one single single answer or, or way to do it. Um, and I, I'm I've been struggling with that as well, to be honest. And I think that's what we we all we're all feeling right now a little bit a little bit lost. That's just. I mean, I think the a question of like, what should we as Asian Americans do to prevent these attacks? I don't know. What should I do to prevent myself from being attacked? Like, <laughs> the question is, I don't know because I didn't do anything wrong in that situation. Like, you know, I'm not the one it's who's doing angry. the He's yeah. Angry, no, right? but I'm like, <laughs> what is it that I have to do to stop from being attacked? Right? Like, 
Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I don't know what measure that has to take for for other people to stop seeing me as someone who needs to be attacked. Uh, you know, I'm just out here living my life. You know, so um, that that to me is not a question of like something that I have to do. Right? Like, I don't stop the racism, man. Like that's the, <laughs> that's that's you know, agenda number one. I, I will say last thing like that. I think that there is a, a difference in terms of the tone of how um, our community is reacting, though, and, and in a positive way. And, and I think that we are beating our chest more than what I've noticed in the past before. Um, and again, that's the another good side of social media is that we are galvanizing with each other. We are able to support each other. There's also the dark sides of social media where you're seeing a, another side of the, <laughs> of the conversation. But anyways, my, my point is, is that I think because of all the progress that we've made over the last 30 years, we are feeling more emboldened. We are feeling more um, entitled to say, hey, we deserve to be here. Hey, we deserve to be upset about this. We're not just some foreigner that's, yeah, like we, um, we should be quiet and keep our heads down. That is what a lot of our parents taught us to, keep our heads down, tallest blade of grass gets cut, all that stuff, right? But now we have a new generation or a new me mentality because of all the content, all the media, all the progress that we've made these last 30 years to say, hey, like, no, we, we are part of the mainstream. We deserve to be covered. We deserve to be um, uh, treated uh, equally in, in terms of how, we're, how our stories and how our uh, tragedies are covered. So I think that's what, something that I've definitely noticed, and I think that's a, a really powerful thing, and, and I, hope it, I hope it keeps expanding. Yeah. Um, I love this question, by the way, because it goes back to also the question of being Asian and, and American. Because my answer would have been like, I mean, I feel like boba is just as American as hamburgers, you know, <laughs> around here. So as More someone, so. <laughs> <laughs> as someone born and raised in the Bay Area, I appreciate your use of boba throughout the book. Can you speak to any discussions you may have had regarding style, uh, terminology, or spelling of foreign words, and how those decisions were made? Mm -hmm. Question by Kevin. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's well, funny because uh, I think actually even the term. Boba uh, was something that in so we have we have like four pieces on boba in the book for whatever reason, um, but one of them is uh, looks at the kind of history of how boba became this this cultural good right that both became mainstream unexpectedly, uh, but also uh, became this sort of gathering point almost like a sim symbolic thing that young Asian Americans ended up rallying around culturally in a lot of ways. And one of the things that came out of that was that there's an east-west divide. Uh, on the east coast, it's called bubble tea. And on the west coast, it's called boba tea. And that, that difference uh, hinges on a, a bunch of stuff. But not least, apparently, boba as slang, some people find it in, uncouth because it, it uh, you know, supposedly refers to, like, boobs. <laughs> uh, when, when boba tea was first invented you know, in Taiwan, et cetera, it was popularized as boba tea because, you know, the floating bubbles, whatever. Anyway, so. We'll save that for another show. We'll save that for another. But, you know, the, this, is, this is part of what I think makes some of this, the stories being told here so interesting. Language matters, right? Symbols matter. And when we talk about what pop culture means and why we call this a pop history, well, it's really not a pop culture history. It's a popular history of Asian America. But by definition, in the last 30 years, a lot of that has really been written in, in pop culture for that reason. Yeah, think, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think a big attitude that we had going into the book was that, you know, we wanted some things, some pieces to be explainers, but not too much. Like, we didn't want to have to explain too much. Like, th this is not like your guy to... Asian America, you know, like look outside looking in, like we're like, this is written by us, like for people who, you know, who, who live this and know and understand this, you know, so we wanted to have a, some, somewhat of an insidery feel. So I, I felt like, I don't think we ever felt the too much need to like over explain anything. Like they might not know what this means. So like, forget it. Let's just write it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say this though. There are, there are pieces in the book, which we really cherish that are designed to have two effects. You know, uh, we call them spaces, right? They're these big fold-out four-page things where we have this giant illustration of some aspect of Asian American life, and we're literally asking you to step into that. You know, it's annotated by us. So all the things you might have seen across different ethnicities in these spaces, uh, whether it's the Asian American home, Asian American grocery stores, culture festivals, etc. These these are all things which, if you were there, if you know, you know, 
right? If you were there, you'll recognize and feel nostalgic. But if you weren't, well, look, step in, right? We're not going to, you know, we're, we're going to ask you to take off your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but we will invite you to sit down. And, and that's kind of the approach we took with the book in general. I want to remind everyone that it's just only five years ago that Jimmy Fallon was gagging while drinking boba on his show. So <laughs> we've, we've made a lot of progress. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get to 2010s and then uh, the rest of the questions, because I think they're perfect to end the program with before y'all do some book signing. So yes, we have some books out there. If you haven't gotten your copy, today's your lucky day. You can get some and you can get it signed. And if you brought yours, you can get it signed. Um, all right, 2010s. Oh, my nervous. What, I don't know how far you shoot. <laughs> grill him, grill him. Get him. We went through this in the green room. Yeah. <laughs> We're well prepared. No, I'm just going to stop at the, uh, I'm going to start at the top. Three months before the 2010s officially began, I already knew there was going to be something really special about the decade to come. I'm going to stop there because I think that's a good starting point. So, yeah, the story goes on to just say that, um, I was at this this concert that my company and another company threw, uh, and it was the f one of the basically one of the first um, events, musical events, performances, uh, showcases that brought together YouTube talent. Um, there's there have been other shows that were just like you know just general talent shows, but this was the first time where it was creators that were on YouTube, on social media, that had built up their own audience in their, from their bedroom, literally singing on their bedroom floors. And we were th the first time that we were seeing, hey, will that translate to a live event and a live show? And I remember sitting on the side of the stage, um, David Choi was singing one of his songs, and he did something that I've only seen at mainstream concerts, which was he stopped singing, and just a thousand people continued singing his song. And it was, so incredibly moving to me, and, and I just thought, this is, this is weird. Like, I, I understand if this was like a, a, a radio artist or something, but this guy's just on YouTube, and this is coming from someone that was also just on YouTube. <laughs> and I'm like, are, 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 we, are we allowed to have this? Is, this? is this something that can happen in, in our reality? And I feel like I had a lot of those moments throughout the 2010s where I felt, oh, did we actually get there? Like, uh, almost a little bit earlier than I, than I had thought. Um, obviously, like having these musical artists being able to command thousands of people to know their songs, never being on the radio once, never having a major label promote them. You have Jeremy Lin taking over the world just, you know, a two years into the 2010s. I remember after Yao Ming retired, I was so sad because I, I, first of all, I thought, okay, we're not going to get another Asian um, superstar for a very, very long time, much less an Asian American superstar. I thought it was going to be decades. And it happened two years in. And I'm like, oh, wow. Are we there? And then, <laughs> and then Crazy Rich Asians, you know, um, I, I go into my piece, I stopped at a bus, like I, was, I literally pulled to the side of the road because I saw a bus stop with the Crazy Rich poster. I'm, why am I getting emotional right now? <laughs> and, and again, same, same feeling. Are we there yet? This, like we actually get to have a poster of, of us as a mainstream movie. Andrew Yang, whatever you feel about him, 20, in the, like 20, 2019, 2020, are we there yet also? Like all these moments that 2010 kind of started really ramping up of, oh wow, we're, we're reaching this like critical mass or we're reaching this point where there's a lot of us out there that are doing really cool things and also taking control of our destiny through technology, through building our own audiences, through the different products and platforms so that we can make our mark on the mainstream. And I just, would, I just couldn't have imagined that you know, s stuff that I was doing uh, in my bedroom also, or my dorm room, at the, I should say, would, would be part of this kind of this trend, or I don't even want to say trend because it's just a way of life now. And that's what, to me, what the 2010s really, really showed. We, we built on all this progress of magazines, blogs, internet, so t to a point where we really, so many people out there, everyone here in this audience has control of, 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 of their destiny. I was I was at that concert that you're yeah. talking about. It was weird, right? Yeah. Uh, my, no, I, and I, I that's the moment I remember specifically yeah. from that concert too, where David's singing out, and then everyone was singing along, and my wife and I looked at each other and we were like, "We're old." <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how I feel now. If I were if I saw like uh, you know someone do a TikTok dance and everyone doing it, and, I'm, and I have no idea what that TikTok dance is, but okay, I guess it's a thing. But yeah, it was it was. It was a beautiful, beautiful sight to see, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he was, it was like one of our friends that was able to kind of lead that way. And 
more. I mean, meaning there are more pages to write. And so uh, as we wind down on our program here, there is a question here, what you or what is a story or perspective that you each would like to see for page 501? <laughs> I mean, we, we end the book. Uh, we actually begin the book with a chapter called Before, and we end the book with one called Beyond. And uh, we actually we dedicate the book to those who come next, right? Because we, in that last chapter, talk about how, in the course of writing this book, a lot of things turned on their axis. Uh, initially towards a, a very dark place, you know, where we felt like this book that was supposed to be about celebration all of a sudden was about preserving things in amber, you know, creating a blueprint in case we had to rebuild, right? Uh, that, that darkness uh, of, of that early era in which we started writing this book. But then, you know, but then we, we saw people coming up, this resilient generation of people, uh, this, this cohort of, of uh, younger folks who were taking this on the chin, on the one hand, and still standing up. And the, the biggest thing we saw was that this is not just Asian Americans, but non-Asians as well. There was a new and incredible appetite, a new awareness that there's a world far outside America's borders, and that that world was a part of our legacy as Asian Americans and, and as Americans, period, that we could access all those things because the, the, the boundaries that existed between cultures, the same technology that kind of made a lot of our uh, ability to rise <laughs> uh, was also opening doors. Uh, I attended my first uh, BTS concert. Uh, <laughs> talk about feeling old, right? Uh, but I, I went there and uh, it was incredible. I mean, I'd, I'd never seen that many people talk about singing along. Imagine if, if they were singing along, but they were singing Korean, right? Like phonetic Korean. Uh, that's what we saw. We saw this, this incredible world where Asian, uh, seven Asian guys were creating something aspirational to the point where an entire global army had formed around them and continues to do things much beyond simply going to concerts, but you know, changing the world in small and big ways. We, we've seen uh, food cultures, we've seen music cultures, we've seen cinema cultures and TV cultures, all of them just changed dramatically by the very fact that the world has become more permeable. And you know, we didn't even get some of this stuff in the book because it was happening as we spoke, but like, Holy shit, you know, Parasite won a bunch of Oscars, and it's a subtitled movie, and it's a Korean movie, and it's a movie that legitimately, right, was talking about stuff that here in America feels like it's burning down houses, right? But it was there, and we were there. And so I guess what, what I would say is um, on page 501, the first page of Rise 2, Two Rise, Two Furious, whatever it's going to call uh, <laughs> It, we would be talking about the, the many things that feel like they have finally pivoted away from simply focusing on ourselves in some ways as a minority fraction of America and maybe part of a global majority. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say something controversial here to the three of us. <laughs> I, I can also imagine where there is not a need for a second book. And what I mean by that is when we when we were doing all the research for all these pieces there's so much content in here it was heartbreaking that you would have a three hour long conversation with someone incredibly inspiring and for the movement and for the progress and then have to parse it down to like two pages right each piece in here could be its own book and i think the reason why this book works at this period of time right now is because no one has put together everything all like you, you sure you can go on, on on the internet and find you know s articles and snippets you know to 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 put together the information here but in in one one solid piece this that's what we've done here right but perhaps in the future we will just have more books that are about each individual topic and we're allowed to have like longer conversations and we're going to be able to go deeper and dive deeper obviously we could only scratch the surface because no one had done it before and we had to like you're saying preserve it otherwise it would be forgotten right but now we've done it and now we've like like you know, we're saying we've reached this 
inflection point where maybe it's okay for us to just have more of our stories that are just an entire book. Um, and I think we're seeing that. And obviously, yeah, maybe Jeff will have a great idea of how Rise to Rise to Furious, uh, <laughs> Ian Hill bamboo bamboozle us back in. Um, but I think one thing we, we joke about too is that maybe ideally, you know, we're not waiting another 30 years. We'll have enough content for, from just five years. We'll have enough content for maybe just a couple years, right? So I would love to see just anyone like, open this book and say, hey, that should be its own book. Or maybe the creators themselves are, will, will see it and say, hey, I'm gonna actually write my own book about this. And, and then we'll all get to enjoy that. I'm with Phil who talked about we must tell our own stories. And there's a question here I think that will be appropriate for the last 60 seconds for you to briefly just either agree or not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this question is great. It's about institutionalizing this effort of us moving forward and telling our own stories. So who do you think, um, you know, what, who or what organization will do this after you? Uh, <laughs> I'm very curious, Phil. I, I honestly don't know. It's up to everybody, honestly. Like, here's the thing. Like, the burden of writing this book, I was like, I honestly wish it did not fall to <laughs> us. You know what I mean? I wish that this had been happening all along and then someone else had been institutionalized and canonizing this kind of work. And But... Um, maybe that's what we're headed towards, I think. Like, my answer to the previous question is like, actually, like, I am looking forward to Asian American mediocrity in that <laughs> not everything has to matter so much, right, that we have to put it in this book that's so special. And like, what if like, Asian Americans could just be comfortable with like, what we're doing now and, and the, the accomplishments that we have and th that are like, not everything has to hang on the success. It will, the success of this will make or break Asian America. You know, this one film, this one, you know, this one book, whatever. You know, I, I, I'm looking forward to a time where, like, we can just be ourselves and be, be, be happy with this, be content in the things that we, are, we produce. And maybe it'll fail, maybe it'll be, succeed, maybe it'll break barriers, or maybe it'll just be the next thing that goes down by the wayside. But, um, but I hope that we can have sort of a, a, a culture making that is not so dependent on the one, on, on the chosen one. You can, know? I can't wait till your daughter comes back with a report card and said, Dad, you said Asian mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Dad. worry. My son has already yeah. played that card. Yeah. Trust me. Um, <laughs> roll you guys, tape. You guys yeah. had it. Yeah, he said yeah. it. <laughs> but, you know, on that note, I mean, so, you know, that whole notion of, of uh, Asian mediocrity and this feeling that somehow every single thing we do has to be a giant success, or at least not embarrassing, right? Or it'll destroy us, salt <laughs> the earth for decades, right? That whole Margaret Cho thing, the coda to that, you know, the, the, <coughs> the thing that kind of came back at me and at, at Asian America is that a couple decades later, there was another, finally, Asian American show. Uh, it did, in fact, star unaccountably uh, my son, Hudson Yang, uh, as, <laughs> as Eddie. And, and all of a sudden, that whole notion of karma just was like, you know, driving right at my face. And, you know, was this going to be another opportunity for us to uh, boldly go into pop culture, crash, burn, and then again, s s have nothing, right? And fresh off the boat, when it came out, uh, it was surprisingly uh, fresh, again, per its name, uh, and different, but also familiar, right? It, it carved out the space where it felt like Asian American content could be both different and specific, and maybe defiantly so in some ways, without explanations. Um, but that specificity actually was what made it universal, right? And the reason I bring it up actually in the context of mediocrity uh, is because when we were all waiting for it to come out, when we were all carrying it on our shoulders, doing events like this, you know, watch parties, like I said, you know, trying our best to make sure that eyeballs were on this thing. Uh, one of the things that, that Phil did was he created these, uh, you know, a series of, of sort of like post-show uh, conversations about each episode for the entire season called Fresh Off the Show. And at the very first talk back after the first episode, he, he kind of coined this term that even today, I feel, carves out uh, the entire territory of this feeling of pressure we have as a community to not have stuff suck, right? Uh, which I'll let you talk to. Yeah, well, it was coined by me, my wife, Joanna Lee, and uh, Jenny Yang. Um, it was before this, the, the first episode aired, and we were like, what is this anticipation or this feeling that we feel like, 
uh, oh, please don't suck, right? <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be good, but please don't suck. Uh, and that, that term we came up with was the rep sweats, the represent, representation sweats. Th that feeling you get, we're like, oh my gosh, oh, there's an Asian? Oh my, okay, please be good, please be good. <laughs> you know, we're like, it's the rep uh, sweats. I'm glad I got the rep sweats right before I walked <laughs> up in here. Um, everyone, I think that we all can agree that the, it w this wasn't mediocre. We love it. We, it was the greatest thing. It is the greatest thing. Rise. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for Jeff Phil and Phil. Oh. Can we take a picture? Uh, Thank you with so you much guys for before for you leave. Oh, before you leave, oh. we want to get come up here too. House lights. Yeah, because <laughs> this is kind of cool to us. We have who has the long arm? Here, I got Lincoln. Okay. <laughs> um, everybody's. <laughs> All right, ready? One, two, three. Nice. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Woo!